Welcome back. I'm Aaron Brinker. And I'm Tobin Brinker. And we are on the Brink, the morning show on KCAA AM 1050 and FM 106.5. We are joined now by attorney Mark Leonardo. He has successfully litigated and tried cases in front of judges, juries, and arbitrators in the areas of employment, real estate, business, and personal injury. He now works side-by-side side with Robert Ryan and other lawyers at the Cusick Law, at, at Cusick Law, exclusively representing victims of auto and motorcycle accidents, slip and fall, dog bites, and other incidents leading to personal injuries. And the topic today is... You know, when people sue cities, and, and uh, Tobin was a city councilman here in the city of San Bernardino, uh, and the city of San Bernardino gets sued all the time, especially when it comes to uh, things that go on with the police department here in this great city. Uh, and so we welcome to the show Mark Leonardo. Mark, how are you? Very good. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, great to have you on. So, you know, we keep hearing about the big the big news stories of the of right now are uh, these police shootings and and um, you know excessive use of force, et cetera. And these families almost in a, almost always sue. Um, so, tell us about what that process is like. Um, yeah, it seems like it's becoming an epidemic across the country. Um, what happens when when it does when you do have a shooting like this? The first thing the family does when they hire a lawyer is they file what's called a tort claim. And a tort claim is a, is a procedure you have to file within the first six months after the incident occurs. It's, it's making a written claim against the, the county or city, whatever the case may be. And 99 times out of 100, the city or county, they always deny that claim. And then once you have that take place, um, that's kind of your, your permission ticket to go to court. And then they can go file their lawsuit in court. That's kind of the procedural aspect of how that works. So, you know, in a lot of these cases, the, the person who ends up suing is doing no up to no good. He's out there doing a drug deal at 2 o'clock in the morning, and the he reaches in his pocket to get a cell phone, and the cops shoot him or something like that. Um, and, of course, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Uh, is there any recourse for a city – if the family sues, and it was obviously – uh, the the bad guy's fault, or you know, how does that process work? Well, the, the city tries to, um, or the police department, whichever case it may. Usually, it's the the city is the is the defendant that sued because the police officers work for the city. So um, you know, they try to defend themselves and come up with some reason as to why they were justified in you know using excessive force. So I know that there's a, one of the examples here is a family man was fatally shot by police. Uh, he filed a federal lawsuit against the city. Um, uh, can you talk about that case? Yeah, there's a case that just was filed recently in the uh, district court in Los Angeles. And it was brought against the uh, Long Beach Police Department in the city of Long Beach. Um, what happened there was the individual, a guy by the name of Marlon uh, Bacon, He's 39 years old, and he had a mental disability, and he was at a uh, arcade slash casino out there in Long Beach, and he had a pocket knife, and he was carving into a table or something, and the management told him, "Hey, you can't do that. Put that pocket knife away." And he, and he did. And later on, he was he frequented this casino quite often, apparently, and he was showing a couple of his friends this knife. He was kind of like proud of his of this little pocket knife he came across. He wasn't threatening anybody. Nobody was afraid of it. But a couple of customers that didn't know him reported it to management, and management came and asked him to put it away, and he did. And they tried to get him to leave, but he, he didn't leave. So he sat in a chair, and he was watching TV. So the, the management called the police, and they, under the uh, claim of a 5150, if you know what that means, that's mm-hmm. someone who needs to be put you know, in, in, uh, at the hospital first to see what's going on and maybe, you know, keep them there locked up for a while. And so the police were made aware, apparently, that, that it was a 5150 call. And they came in, brandishing their guns, pointing at him, and he's sitting in this chair just watching TV. And the knife is sitting on his lap, allegedly, and it's not even open. And they could see that. And they asked him to put the knife down, and he didn't respond because he was kind of off days watching TV or whatever he was doing. And then he did, because he didn't put the knife down, they tased him. And then that didn't do anything. So they came up and they started beating him in the head with a baton. Oh, my gosh. And then, and then inexplicably, uh, one of the officers began shooting at him. 
eight times, unloaded his entire pistol, shot wow. him eight times, and he was dead. But within less than two minutes of their arrival, uh, Mr. Stikhan was killed. And there was no aggressive threats. There was no threat to anybody. There was no provocation. There was, there was nothing in this case, if you believe everything that the, uh, the plaintiffs were saying. That's kind of what happened in this case. I am very, very now, gobsmacked. Is this one of those ones where they have camera footage? Because if he's inside a casino, they usually have lots of cameras and stuff. Is this? Do they have that kind of evidence? The, the, the plaintiff's attorneys, uh, by the way, you have the, the attorney is a guy named Dan Stormer. He's a very well-renowned civil rights lawyer. So he, they have a, you know, a big-time lawyer on this case. Uh, they say that they have seen some of the video footage. I don't think it's anything direct. Uh-huh. But they've seen some of the video footage, and they've talked to many of the witnesses who have corroborated what I just told you, yeah. that there was no aggression by this guy at all. He was just sitting in a chair the entire time. Never got, never got out of the chair. I, I, so, I'm gobsmacked. I, I imagine there were lots of witnesses uh, to this. And what are the witnesses saying? The witnesses have, have corroborated the same story that I just told you. So, so what's changing the environment today is so many people have cell phones and cell phone cameras. You know, I think this stuff always happened in the past, too, but people just di- didn't know about it or didn't see it. But with social media and these videos, now people are able to see what's going on. And they're shocked because, you know, we always hear in the, in the newspaper or on the news, the police officer saying, I feared for my safety, I feared for my life. And then you watch the video, and it's like you said, if the guy's just sitting there in the chair, a reasonable person is going to say, well, what were you afraid of? Exactly, exactly. I think, I think the Long Beach is going to have a tough time with this case if the witnesses corroborate what I just told you. Wow. I would agree. Wow. Now, a lot of these cases that we've seen nationwide, the ones that have gotten the most uh, press, you know, in in Ferguson and in Baltimore and in many of these other places, the officers end up being acquitted. Uh, can the families that in most jurisdictions, I know everyone is different, go back and, and sue for um, wrongful death, even if the the officers involved were acquitted? Well, if you go back to the very basic case everyone knows, the OJ case, that's, of course, they can do that. Yeah. Obviously, he was acquitted, and they, he was sued in civil court, and they obtained a very big judgment. He never paid and it, by what, the way. <laughs> that's what's been happening. A lot, of, a lot of these cases have been you know, finding judgments in favor of the families for millions of dollars. So I have a question for you. I, I, I've heard that in California that we have the uh, as a police officer's bill of rights, and that it's very hard to get information about these officers. What if there's an officer who's been sued numerous times and, and, and lost these lawsuits and has cost cities millions of dollars, but they're still on the streets? Do you know all that, or, or do you is that hard information to get? Well, to find out if someone has been sued is, is pretty easy because it, it's a public record. Okay. So the, you know, those are, there are databases out there where you can find out who has been sued. But the Bill of Rights, you're right, it makes it very difficult where you cannot obtain any of the police officers' personnel records with respect to discipline. So if some like in this case, you have someone who shot this guy, if you want to get those that guy's records, you just can't. It, it, it's not going to happen. So, so if he's been disciplined for discharging his gun before or making bad judgments, you wouldn't have no way of knowing that? You have – well, you may know about the incident somehow, some way, but you wouldn't be able to get the records from the police as to what they did internally, their investigations, and what discipline was gotcha. imposed upon him. Okay. <laughs> Sorry? It makes it very, very difficult sometimes when you're trying to get this information. And in. you know, during a lawsuit, the, the largest phase of any lawsuit is called the discovery phase, and that's where each side tries to discover uh, information the other side has, all the records, the documents. Uh, you ask all kinds of questions, how things happen, and so in, during the discovery process, you want to try to get those records as to what this police officer has been involved in. But because of the Bill of Rights, it's, it's almost impossible in these kinds of cases. And that's that's just California, correct? That's not nationwide. It is a California law, yeah. Okay. So, and I'm I'm not an attorney. I've never gone to law school, so this is this. I've watched a lot of television, though. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the so a family can – if a family is suing, they then can request – you talked about dis- discovery. Um, what can they – if they can't learn about the, the officer's history, you can't, you know, they don't know if he's trigger happy, for example. What other discovery can they get that could, that could prove a case, that help prove a case? Well, to try to prove the case, they'll, they'll take depositions of the various witnesses that were there in the casino and what they saw. If any of those people had uh, – you know. Um, cell phone video footage, we'll subpoena those records and bring that into evidence. 
eventually they'll take the deposition of the officers. There were two officers, one that, you know, one that tased them and hit him in the head with the baton, and the other guy, the one that shot him. We'll, they will take the depositions of both of those two individuals. In a deposition, just for those who don't know, it's, it's a procedure. It's just like testifying in court, only it happens in some lawyer's office. And the other side gets to ask the questions, what happened? And, you know, it's under penalty of perjury. It's under oath. So is there ever a circumstance where it's okay to hit a hit a suspect in the head with a baton? That's a tough question, but, you know, there's the whole self-defense issue and whether you can escalate um, the fight, so to speak. So it's like you know, you've heard the phrase coming to a gunfight with a knife kind of thing. Well, if, if, you, if you're two people are just having a fist fight and somebody pulls out a knife or a baseball bat or a gun, they've escalated it. And you can't necessarily do that unless it's justified. And obviously in the case of what I've described to you, certainly would have been justified under the facts that I relate to you. This reminds me of the Kelly Thomas case in Fullerton where, you know, he was he's just a homeless man. He just And they beat him to death. And, and by all accounts of the witnesses, you know, he was crying for his life and they wouldn't stop. Right. It does sound very similar. Wow. So so we, we are about out of time. So let people know how they can find you, follow you. Are you on social media, et cetera? <laughs> um, they can they can look at our website, which is kuzicklaw.com. And Kuzik has an unusual spelling, uh, K-U-Z-Y-K, law.com. And uh, that's, that's where I can be found. Well, Mark Leonardo, uh, Leonardo, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and very engaging subject, and it, uh, it was terrific having you on.